Uh, hi, I'm Rich Ozer. I'm here at the Chabot Space and Science Center in front of the 36-inch Research Reflecting Telescope, fondly known as Nelly. And uh, we're here for the next, uh, you know, couple hours to hopefully show you some some nice things in the night sky. Um, the weather's good tonight. It's a little smoky, uh, but the seeing is pretty steady. It's certainly hot. Um, and most importantly, um, I'm happy to announce that Alameda County is now allowing for haircuts. So uh, next week, uh, maybe I won't be wearing a hat. <laughs> <laughs> so It's um, dark. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's one of the advantages of, of uh, doing this in the dark here. Hey, hey, my wife is getting good at cutting hair. <laughs> we haven't crossed that boundary in our household yet. <laughs> All right, so where are we starting tonight, Gerald? What do you want to do uh, first? Let's, let's go to Jupiter, all right? All right. Let me, uh, so, I'm going to share uh, uh, the screen here to get to the camera. So bear with me here. All right. All right. Meantime, I'm going to go over to another computer here and control the telescope, send it to Jupiter. That's not Jupiter on the screen, by the way. That's. Uh, <laughs> A second magnitude star that we were focusing on a little bit earlier. All right, here we go. So our 36 inch telescope is computer controlled. So when we want to move it, we don't push it around by hand. We put a computer and tell the computer where we want to look and it does all the work for us. Yeah, we don't want to be pushing it around by hand. It weighs a lot. Okay. All right. Oh, How we are we looking? Uh, not bad. Wanna, let me get the adjustment there. Okay. So uh, I see before, a couple. I see four moons. My yeah, goodness, we, yeah. We we got the full bingo set tonight. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so, that's uh, Callisto me. over to the left. Io in close to the planet Jupiter there, and then Europa and Ganymede out to the right. So we've got it overexposed right now yeah. so you can see the moons. Yeah, and uh, uh, throughout this presentation, please ignore the red dot that's right here <laughs> and the red dot that's right here. Those are hot pixels on my camera that I have named uh, Hubble and uh, Huygens. And, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, we're, we may be switching cameras out uh, for future events. We're talking about doing that. And I think you away, should. But... I think you should call them Hertzsprung and Russell. Uh, that's good. <laughs> that's, those are better names. <laughs> I agree. All right, let's uh, get the exposure changed here. Hold on, I gotta move around these windows. And uh, what we'll do. Get this down to about a thirtieth of a second. That's a little bit better. Yeah, change the ISO. There we go. Maybe even go to fortieth. What do you think? That looks pretty good. I'm going to center it so we can see it. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to put the centering grid on? Or not I wrong way. Get, oops. Yeah, I was going to get it in that uh, frame on the right. There's there's your bullseye. <laughs> there we go. Very That's nice. Good. That's good. I thought you oh, said yeah. the uh, great red spot was visible. Um, <laughs> it's just rolling off the edge right now. Oh yeah, I see it to the which, right. Which which on the on this side here where yeah, my cursor is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so we're losing it. Yeah, we're not yeah. going to see it. Oh, I, here it is. Yeah, you could just barely see right, it right. on the limb. Um, you probably can't see that at home. It's really uh, too difficult. But the uh, cloud bands are very steady tonight. And uh, you could see a little bit of color uh, that you can, couldn't have made out uh, in previous weeks. Um, notice that this is a lighter, much lighter band of clouds right here where my cursor is. Uh, followed by kind of a greenish tinge and a dark brown, light brown, dark brown. Uh, this is nice. Yeah. So Jupiter's uh, 88,000 miles in diameter. It's 11.2 uh, times the diameter of the Earth. 
So it is way bigger than the Earth. It spins very rapidly on its axis. A day on Jupiter is only nine hours and 50 minutes long. And it's a gas giant, so it's just thick clouds that you're seeing. And because of the rapid rotation, uh, it wraps the clouds all the way around uh, the planet. And then you've got high and low pressure areas in the atmosphere, just like on Earth. But those highs and lows wrap around the planet, forming those uh, bands, uh, the dark ones we call belts and the light ones we call zones. One of the things I was concerned tonight about, uh, you know, because of all the heat, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that these large telescope mirrors like we have here behind us um, are thermal sinks. They heat up during the day and they hold their temperature. And then if the night uh, temperatures are lower, they spend uh, a lot of their energy uh, 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 releasing that heat. Uh, in, into the air surrounding the telescope. And that causes the shape of the mirror to change kind of asymmetrically and uh, contributes to poor viewing. And that's sometimes a problem when you have really hot days. But that doesn't seem to be the case tonight because it's still hot. <laughs> well, I can turn the fan on. Yeah. But we'll get some back in there around noise there. But that'll get rid of the boundary layer right on top of the mirror. Might make it even a little bit sharper if you want to try that. Uh, if you want, right, sure. Yeah, sure. Hang on here. Okay, thanks. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, so we have a, a set of fans on the telescope. The, the mirror, the primary mirror, is 36 inches in diameter and it's five inches thick. It's a big, thick piece of glass. And because it's been so hot in the day, during the day, it, it get pretty hot. And it takes a long time for glass to lose its heat. And so what happens is, is you get a warm layer of air right above the surface of the mirror, which adds to the distortion. And, um, uh, it's kind of like if you, uh, on a hot day, you look across the surface of uh, a concrete surface or asphalt, you see that shimmering effect. That's what happens right above the mirror. And so uh, by running these fans, uh, it causes what we call laminar flow. It's a flow of air that smoothly runs across the surface of the mirror, gets rid of that hot boundary layer and hopefully makes things look a little sharper. It, it, it is getting a little sharper, I think. Uh, yeah. Every once in a while, I'm catching some fine detail, so not too shabby. Uh, one of the things we could try here, if you want to try something, um, I'll take it out of live viewing real quick and put it just on uh, imaging. And uh, I'll change it to... 400. Uh, and we'll just try to take single snaps and see what those look like. So, so you decrease the ISO and, and shorten well, no, the I, exposure? I, I, yeah, I'm shortening the exposure time and not doing it in live view. So we'll see if we get. Um, Yep. Okay, that is over, still too bright. Yeah. yeah, it's overexposed. Let me get it to 200. Oh, still. getting there yeah and this might give us a sharper image without because it's not swimming around in the field of view so if i take this and get it blown up here and then just kind of so play you... the uh play the odds here that maybe we'll catch it catch it at a sharp moment 
So you're not stacking these, right? You just no, no. I'm not stacking. I'm just taking individual photos right, and seeing if right. one comes up that's, you know, sharper than the others. See how good your timing is, Richard. Yeah, that's right. This is like if I get a really good one, then I run out and I buy lottery tickets. <laughs> yeah, that one was worse than the previous one, but you get the idea. Yeah, we're still. We're, this is the best we've seen it now in you know, two or three weeks. So. Yeah. Now that one's pretty good. That one. That one we got the cloud bounce a little bit better. Um, but to take down the. There we go. Take down the magnification a little bit and looks a little better. So you'll often see some very sharp images of Jupiter taken from the ground, often by amateur astronomers. And they, they'll use a technique similar to what Richard is doing. They'll take a whole bunch of very short exposures and then they'll go through them and pick out the small subset that are really nice and sharp. And then they'll stack those together to eliminate the noise and sharpen things up even more. And you can often end up with some really spectacular uh, images of Jupiter. Alan wants me to go to 160th. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's see. He must know something. Yeah, I don't know. What does Alan know here <laughs> that we don't know? Ah, that's not bad. Let's uh, bump up the ISO, brighten it up. That's not bad. Yeah. So if you want to find Jupiter in the sky, if you go outside tonight, and assuming you've got clear skies, uh, Jupiter is almost straight south right now, uh, about halfway up between the horizon and the zenith. And it's the, the brightest object in that direction that you'll see. And then if you look to the left, if you hold your arm out about uh, to, uh, at arm's length and hold up three fingers, uh, to the left of Jupiter, about three fingers, you'll see another fainter but still fairly bright star. That second object is actually the planet Saturn, and we'll switch to Saturn here in just a minute. All right. That's not a bad one. I'm no, just going to leave it no. there for a minute. No. So again, the, the dark and light areas are called belts and zones. The dark ones are belts and the light, light ones are called zones. Uh, the dark ones represent low pressure and the, the light ones represent high pressure. Uh, but again, these pressure systems wrap themselves all the way around the planet. And if we could zoom in and still have a sharp image, you would see that there's all kinds of swirls and eddies uh, within these bands. Um, that uh, uh, are pretty pretty spectacular. And then of course, there's the one cyclonic uh, event, the Great Red Spot, which has been around for at least probably close to 80 or 90 years, maybe longer. Um, Is that the earliest report of the Great Red Spot? 80 or 90 years ago, really? Um, it may not have been quite that long ago, but it was already there the first time somebody actually got a good image of it. So it's been around wow. for quite a while. Yeah, at least wow. 50 years. But it also could have been there much longer and no one had ever really just seen exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. right. Right, we right. just don't know. Now you can't see the moon in this exposure because it's too short of an exposure. But well, let's uh, let me bump it up so people who joined just joined can see it. So I'm going to overexpose it so uh, that way we can get some of the moons. You got to reduce your magnification too. Yeah. Oh no! no we got all of them. There they are. One, two, three, four. Actually, they were all in the, the frame 
earlier when, when it was zoomed in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I've got a window blocking the last yeah. one. Good. Yeah, so uh, what is it? It's uh, Callisto on the left, John. Is that correct? That's right. Callisto on the left, um, Io in close to the planet, and then Europa, and then Ganymede. Okay. Ganymede is the bright one right at the edge of the frame. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. It's bigger than our moon, bigger than any of the other moons around any of the other planets in our solar system. So it's a big moon. It's actually bigger than the planet Mercury. So that gives you an idea how big it is. Uh, if it was orbiting the sun instead of Jupiter, we would consider it a planet. We got a comment from Joan saying that in 1831, the red spot was first seen. Oh, thank oh. you for that information. Wow. We're going to have to look that up. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so Samuel my, Heinrich Schwab. Well, I did say at least 80 or 90 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to mention to folks uh, who are joining us on Facebook, I, I guess that's the only way people are joining us tonight. Um, there was somebody posting uh, what looked like uh, phishing uh, messages to watch virtual telescope and it would be some link that we don't recognize it has nothing to do with us. I've tried to delete those and I just blocked that person. So don't click on the link. We have no idea what it is. So there. All right. Well. I think we've uh, beat Jupiter to death here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so how about if we go to Saturn? That sounds like a plan. All right. Why don't you switch to live view? Yep. And here we go. Okay. Yep, I see it. I think we'll brighten this up a little bit. All right, that's not bad. All right, I can see some banding around it. Uh, you can on the right hand side, you can see the Cassini division. Yeah, like right yeah, where right my there. cursor is. That's your best place to look for that in this image. Um, in a few moments, we'll try the same trick and bring it down to single shorter exposures. But uh, I'm just kind of enjoying looking at it live right now. Yeah, really. And yeah. you can see um, it's, it's an effect of the seeing. If you look on the left side where my cursor is, you'll see the Cassini division, which is a gap in the rings. Um, you're actually looking through the rings into space behind it. Uh, it pops in and out. And that gives you a sense of you know, how atmospheric seeing affects our um, our images uh, when we're looking through a telescope or photographing through a telescope. So if you stare on the left-hand side, you'll see that black line kind of pop in and out. Yeah, so those, those rings that you see are actually made out of ice, icy, little icy bodies. Um, and most of them are, you know, fist size or smaller. Uh, there's some that are the size of a small desk. Uh, the ring structure is actually very thin. It's only about 10 to 15 meters thick on average. There's a few places where it's thicker, especially if there's, uh, there's these little mini moons that are embedded in the rings at various locations. And those can cause some disruption in the rings that make it seem a little thicker. Well, I don't know about you, this, this view of Saturn, well, not tonight's view, but a, a view of Saturn like this is what hooked me on uh, astronomy and telescopes in the first oh, place. Oh, I think it's hooked a lot of people, yeah. so. Yeah, I, I'm I mean, one of those too. Yeah. I, I grew up in Los Angeles and you were able to count on one hand the number of things you could see in the night sky generally. <laughs> and this was often one of them. And uh, I remember turning a telescope on it and saying, wow, this is pretty amazing. Yeah, I've, you know, we do a lot of um, outreach programs, all three of us, John, uh, Richard and I are all three members of the East Bay Astronomical Society, and 
back in the day before COVID, we would do outreach programs, going to schools and other public events and set up the telescopes. And uh, it's amazing to see the reaction you get when people first see Saturn through a telescope. They come up to the telescope expecting to see a fuzzy dot. And instead they see a planet with a ring around it and they're, they're amazed. We get, get lots of very startled exclamations when, when they see it for the first time. And we also get accused of pasting things on the front of the telescope. Too. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've gotten that one. It, it, people yeah, look yeah. around to the front to look for the slide projector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Richard, if I can share my screen for a second. Oh, yeah, you should have rights. So All right. Just... So I'm going to stop ahead, you, stop you, and show you an image here that. Uh, Thing might be interesting. This is a close-up of the outer portion of the rings. Um, and you can see that the big rings are actually composed of hundreds and hundreds of little rings. And you see a little gap there with what looks like some sort of disruption in the ring. And if you look in that little gap, you see uh, a little dot. That is a small moon, a uh, very small moon that's within that gap. And that moon, although it's very small, it does have gravity. And the gravity tends to tug on the ice particles in the rings. Now the ice particles that are closer to the, to the planet, closer to Saturn than the moon, orbit a little faster than the moon. And the ice particles that are farther from uh, Saturn than the moon orbit a little slower than the moon. And so what you get is that effect of disruption going in one way uh, closer to the moon or to Saturn and the other direction farther from it. And, and all that's happened here is that gravity of that moon has disrupted the particles of ice, kicked them out of their uh, nice flat orbit and eventually they settle back down into it, but it, get, it gets this, this really neat effect. Now this was taken at a time when the rings were nearly edge on uh, from the point of view of the sun. And so that's why that moon, even though it's small, it casts a very long shadow across the top of the ring there. So anyway, I thought that was a pretty cool image. This was taken by the Cassini spacecraft, which orbited Saturn from 2004 until 2015. Somebody was asking uh, if uh, we'd be able to see Pluto through this telescope. Mm -mm. And I'm quite certain we would be able to see it visually we, under, we... Uh, under the right cir circumstances. But uh, photographically, we'd have to take a fairly long exposure. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Pluto is about to... It's hard. Yeah. Yeah, Pluto is about the same brightness as a relatively faint star. So, yeah, we would need to do a long exposure. I, Pluto's up. In fact, it's not too far away from uh, where we're pointing right now. Uh, but it would take a long exposure. And then what you would see is a whole bunch of stars. And we would say, that star right there is Pluto. Take our word for it. You know, so. Yeah, we, we have seen Pluto live with this telescope. And it's possible. It's just it's very very dim, very hard to see. Well, we'll have to wait uh, for fall to see the other planets as well. Yeah. We're getting asked about Mars and Neptune, um, Uranus, and yeah, Mar those Mars. Those are all going to be fall objects. Mars will be up later on tonight, but uh, not until late. Uh, but if you wait until October, uh, then it will be high enough for us to observe around this time of the evening. Which is good because uh, we don't want to run out of things to show you. you know? No, and, no. And we need we need we need stuff to come into play. You know, later in the year, we're always thinking ahead. Yep, yep. We've scheduled a whole bunch of stuff to show up. You know, at the appropriate times. You know. <laughs> yeah, it took some doing, but you know, <laughs> that's what they pay us for. Okay, so uh, we're we're on Saturn right now. Uh, want I'm me to go back? Uh, yeah, if you want to, because we're going to slew to another object here. We're going to do right. a couple of steps to keep the telescope synchronized. 
So that is a nice view. I'm enjoying this. Well, you want me to stay on it or? <laughs> no, no, we can move on. All right. Don't mind me. You can leave the picture. You can just flip on the. Yeah, that's right. I, I'll, just take, <laughs> I'll, I'll just take a still image here and leave it there. <laughs> yeah, but then we won't know when we get to the star. So I'm going to salute All a right. star. Uh, it's a relatively faint star, but uh, we get synced up on it. Gets us a little closer to uh, the next object that we want to look at. Oh, I actually, went, I actually went in the wrong direction. Sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, this will be a bright one. Coco asked a good question. You want to answer that, John? Why isn't Pluto considered a planet anymore? <laughs> I love that question. We get that question a lot. It's you want my it's answer? Considered a dwarf. Planet. I don't know. I don't yeah, know girl. yeah, my answer is it is a planet. <laughs> <laughs> it is a dwarf planet. So we have terrestrial planets. We have giant planets. We have dwarf planets. And we have minor planets. So next time somebody asks you how many planets there are in the solar system, you tell them there are millions of them. Because uh, the whole idea of planets is just completely different nowadays because we've got all this equipment that they didn't have a thousand years ago when they came up with the term planet. All right, let's see here. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. There we go. You're dead on on that star. So. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go to M15. Okay. Globular cluster. Yeah. Your favorite globular cluster. Yeah, this is my personal favorite. Most people like M13, but I'm an M15 right. fan. <laughs> we, we, we need some exposure here. All right. I'm going to set this up to take. Uh... Ten Maybe seconds. Ten yep. seconds or something. Yeah, it's 1600. And let's see what that does. So while we're waiting, this is the globular star cluster M15, which is in the constellation Pegasus. M15 is a little over 33,000 light years away. There we go. Okay. And so we need to go north a little bit. Okay. Let me abort that. I am going to make it a 20 second exposure at a slightly lower ISO, just so we get a little less noise. Yeah. So, so there are about 150 globular clusters orbiting around our galaxy. These are like balls of stars out in space. Um, they're very dense, some more dense than others. M15 is one of the denser ones. In fact, M15 is what we call a core collapse globular star cluster. It hosts somewhere around 400 to 500,000 stars. Um, and these stars orbit around the cluster uh, in highly elliptical orbits. So an elliptical orbit is a, like an oval. If you can imagine a stretched out oval Many of the stars in the uh, cluster orbit in that highly elliptical orbit. So they go in close to the center and then they swing out. Yeah, I screwed you up there. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Next one will correct for it. So they swing way out and then they come back in and they just go round and round and round going in close 
When they're in close to the center, they're moving very rapidly. When they're out far from the center, they're moving very slowly. Um, now there are other stars that orbit around the center much closer in, uh, which is why we call it a core collapse uh, cluster. And uh, when we measure the density uh, of the core, it's so dense, there's so much mass packed into that core that there is a strong suspicion that there's actually an intermediate black hole, intermediate mass black hole at the center of the cluster. Now it's possible that not many of the globular star clusters have black holes at their center, uh, but this one has gotten a lot of study because of that very dense core. And uh, when we measure the mass of the cluster, which one way we do that is by measuring the orbital velocities of the stars. Um, and uh, the orbital velocity is a function of the mass of the cluster. Uh, so we compute the mass of the cluster and how much of it is concentrated near the center. And it, it's a pretty good indication that there's a intermediate black hole at the center of the cluster. So this is M15 in uh, Pegasus. Um, somebody was asking, what consumer telescope do I need to be able to see something like this? And actually, um, you don't need a lot. Uh, yeah. The first time I ever saw M15 was with a very inexpensive four inch uh, reflecting telescope. Um, you could also see it through a good pair of binoculars. Yeah, a, a, f a four and a half inch or six inch um, Dobsonian telescope, which is a reflecting telescope, should show this very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the brightest of the uh, globular star clusters, but it's one of the easiest to find. And another even brighter globular star cluster is M13 in the constellation Hercules. And both of these are right at the fringe of being naked eye visible. So if you get in a really good dark location, high up in the mountain somewhere, you can actually see them if you know where to look, you can see them with your naked eye. And it, makes, uh, it makes searching for globular clusters uh, a lot of fun because on one end of the spectrum, you, there's some that you could almost see naked eye. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are some that are so difficult to find and see that you're never even really sure if you saw them at all. Harold, we have an asteroid question for you. Okay. Um, it's referring to, uh, I'm not sure what this is, an asteroid approaching in November. Are you aware of <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a fun topic. Let, it, let Gerald answer this one. <laughs> M much ado about nothing. <laughs> okay, so yes, uh, on November 2nd, the day before election day, there is an asteroid that is getting some attention, undue attention, uh, that uh, may come sort of close to the Earth. Most likely, it will actually be a little bit farther than the moon. Uh, it's an asteroid that was discovered in 2018. And uh, unfortunately, there was only about a two-week period in which they could observe it. So the, the calculated orbit is not as accurate as we would like it to be. Uh, uh, the nominal orbit has it passing the Earth actually slightly farther than the moon. Uh, but if you t throw in all the potential errors in the observations, uh, all observations have errors. So when I say error in science, the word error does not mean a mistake. It means that whatever measuring technique you're using has limitations and we quantify those limitations and call those the errors. So when we quantify the limitations of the observations that have been taken um, and calculate possible alternate orbits, one of those alternate orbits has that asteroid passing uh, at a distance of about 20% of the uh, distance between the Earth and the Moon. Um, I moved the telescope again. Sorry about that, Richard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so um, that's uh, one of the alternate uh, um, orbits, but it's also one of the least likely of the alternate orbits. So most likely it's going to 
pass us at a very comfortable distance, uh, about the same distance, or maybe a little bit farther than the moon. And it's not a very big asteroid, so it's really no big deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> but somebody, somebody was looking up asteroids and saw that there was one going to come sort of close on the day before election day. And so now it's being promoted as the election day asteroid. Okay. All right. We have some uh, good questions about globular clusters. Uh, All right, good. <laughs> first, first one is, um, what is the difference between a globular cluster and a galaxy? I think I can answer that. So a globular cluster yeah. is a much smaller thing than a galaxy. It, it is hundreds of thousands of stars compared to a galaxy's billions of stars, right? So in, in our case uh, here, we're looking at maybe 200, 250,000 stars uh, in a yeah. gravitationally bound clump. Uh, to help answer one of the other questions on the list, uh, yes, they are all moving. Everything is moving. Everything is in orbit around everything else. And uh, over enough time, uh, you would see stars that are in the, uh, you know, the, the recesses of this globular cluster come to the forefront because of their orbit. Um, now, galaxies are much farther away. They're outside of our galaxy uh, in deep space. And you were, they're usually, uh, you know, millions of light years away and or tens of millions of light years away or hundreds of millions of light years away. And if we look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is one of our nearest neighbors, uh, we can see globular clusters in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, we can take this telescope behind us, and if we know exactly what to look for, we could find uh, Andromeda's globular clusters. And they are, of course, in orbit around the, uh, the central uh, core of the Andromeda galaxy. So I hope that helps. Um, Speaking of Andromeda, we're going to play... With yeah, that, a little bit that's our, yeah, that, that's going to be our next target, by the way. Um, you want to go to, one for, to M57 uh, first? Or we want, want to go well, before, before we do that, there was one other question. Um, and I don't know if you answered this earlier, but it's a good question. Maybe you could explain it again if you did. And how do we measure the mass of the core of a globular cluster? Or is it just yeah, speculation and estimate? You, you get a very big scale now. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the orbital velocity of any object, whether it's a planet orbiting around the sun or the moon orbiting around Jupiter, the orbital velocity is determined by the mass of the parent body. In the case of a star orbiting around the, the globular star cluster, and all the stars you see are orbiting around the center of that cluster. Um, those, the orbital velocity of those stars is governed by the mass of the uh, globular star cluster. So what we do is we use a technique called the Doppler shift to measure the velocity of a star. We pick one of the stars that you can see in the field and observe it over time. Um, and by looking at the shift of the spectra, uh, if it's moving toward us, the spectra will shift towards the blue part of the spectrum. If it's moving away, it will uh, shift towards the red part of the spectrum. Uh, some of you may have heard of the term red shift, and that's what we're referring to. Um, and the amount of shift is based on the velocity of the star. So we can use that technique to make a pretty good estimate of what the velocity of the star is. Within, once we know the velocity of the star, we can then calculate the mass of the globular star cluster. So when we talk about the star cluster having, uh, so with this one, the last paper I read for this one, it was about 450,000 stars. They, they don't actually count the stars. What they do is they calculate the mass of the cluster, and then they make a big assumption, and that is that the mass of the sun, of our sun, is the average mass of all stars. So you take the mass of the globular star cluster, divide it by the mass of the sun, you get a big number around 450,000. And so we say this cluster has about 450,000 stars in it. So um, 
there's a there's a lot of assumptions going on in there, but that's sure, that's no, how that it, how it's done. Yep. Um, one of the other questions is, you know, someone is asking, well, what's in the middle of all of this, and what's in the middle of the cluster? Well, you know, the, these clusters are are caused by lots of stars forming in the same place. They were all they all came out of the same what's called molecular cloud. So it's not like there's something different in the middle that has attracted them all. Although there are some exceptions to that. Some globular clusters are thought to have black holes in the center because of extra high density uh, uh, stars that created those conditions. But your average globular cluster is just a collection of stars, just a bunch of stars, and they're not really very close to one another. In fact, if you were on a planet on one of those stars in the globular cluster, your night sky would look a little bit different. Every star in the sky would be very bright, but they'd be far away. You wouldn't be seeing them like 10 suns rising in the morning or something like that. You would, it'd still look like stars. They'd still be far away. Yeah, but it would still be a lot of stars uh, lighting up your sky. We, yeah, we often was, say that if you uh, live on a planet orbiting a star in a cluster like this, you don't really have a nighttime. No. Uh, if it's very close to the center, especially where they're really dense. Yeah, I think it was uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, if I'm correct, uh, wrote a book or a short story called Nightfall. Oh yeah, and it was a you know science fiction book, and it was about a civilization that lived on a planet orbiting a star in a globular star cluster, and once every hundred years or something like that, uh, the stars would all align up so that they actually got a dark night. So they had one night every hundred years or so, and it was a you know global event. Uh, you know when they got their one night. Well, after they launch all those satellites, that's going to be like that here. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't be referring to Starlink, would you? <laughs> no, no, not, not me. I'm not talking about anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think Elon Musk is dialed in right now. No, no. So. Well, he just dropped off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch for comments from him. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. I'm complaining, but I'm trying to be a beta tester also. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what can I say? So should we go to the Ring Nebula? Or... Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. I'll go ahead and stop the. Let me stop the uh, uh, capture here for a sec. Okay. Go to live view so I can do a couple of yeah. steps here to get there. Yep. yep. Okay. Ready when you are. And away we go. M57, Ring Nebula in the constellation Lyra. The, yes. li the lyre, as in the musical instrument. As opposed to someone who doesn't tell the truth. That's correct. <laughs> We're not referring to that constellation. All right, we got that all synced up here. Oh, David looked up that story. It was written in 1968, Nightfall. And it was Arthur C. Clarke? Yeah. No, he says Isaac oh, Asimov. Asimov. He says Isaac, Asimov. okay, okay, all right. I knew it was one or the other. Okay, here we go. Thanks, David. All right, um, we should be there. Yeah, you're gonna need Whoops. to do a, a long exposure though. Yes. Well, look, it looks just like just like. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, let me bump up at risk of having too much noise. Um, we're gonna start here on a 30 second exposure. Um, one of the things I noticed is boy, with it being a warm night, the camera really is twice as noisy. Yep, we need to stick a piece of uh, dry ice on the back side. There you go. Richard is using a digital SLR camera, just a regular Canon digital SLR camera to do these images. 
there is another type of camera that astronomers uh, frequently use. It's designed specifically for astrophotography. And those cameras are actually cooled. Uh, the imaging chip. Oh, very nice. Look at that. Has a, the imaging chip has a cooling circuit on the back side of it uh, that cools it to sub-zero temperatures. And that reduces the amount of noise. So when you look at this image here, you see a whole lot of blotchy kind of red and black blotches and things like that. That's all camera noise. Sean asks, um, how can we find uh, these observing objects so fast and accurately? Well, we cheat a little bit. Yeah. We've got a computer that um, has all of these objects in its database and we can just select any object and tell the, the computer that we want to point the telescope at it. And all of that is done automatically for us very quickly and accurately. So Richard is doing another exposure here and I adjusted the position of the telescope a little bit. Um, this is called a ring nebula. It's also known as M57, Messier 57. And it is what we call a planetary nebula. It's the remnant of a dying star. So this is a star that was once very similar to our sun. It's about 2,300 light years away. And um, this star, when it reached the end of its life, it swelled up, became a red giant star. And then it began to shed its outer layers of gas. Uh, when it becomes a red giant, its gravitational hold on the outer part of the planet or the star is pretty weak. And at the same time, you've got a lot of very strong winds being generated inside the star. And so the, uh, the result is um, it blows off the outer layers of gas and it actually loses quite a bit of its mass. And this goes on for tens of thousands of years. Uh, eventually, the star uh, has lost, you know, close to half of its mass. That exposes the hot interior of the star. Uh, when it's a red giant, the outer part of it is relatively cool. But when it loses its outer layers, it exposes the hot interior of the star. And at the same time, it's running out of fuel for the fusion process that's going on internally in the star. And when that fusion process stops, uh, you no longer have the pressure that holds the star in its uh, size and the star collapses and becomes what's called a white dwarf. The white dwarf is very small and compact. So you started out with a star that was maybe a million miles in diameter. And when it collapses down to white dwarf, it's only maybe 10,000 miles in diameter or even smaller. Um, so it's very small, it's extremely compact. It's a very dense type of matter called uh, degenerate matter. And it has all of the residual heat left over from when it was a regular star. It takes literally billions and billions of years to lose all that heat. And because it's so hot, it, 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 that heat is uh, given off as uh, ultraviolet radiation. And the white dwarf is surrounded by all that gas that it was expelling before it collapsed. And the ultraviolet radiation goes out and ionizes that gas, causing it to glow. Now the gas is mostly hydrogen, but because in it's the late stage of the fusion process, the star was creating oxygen. It has some oxygen in that, that gas cloud surrounding it. And oxygen when it's ionized by the ultraviolet radiation glows in a very bright turquoise color, which is the dominant color on the inner part of the, the ring. Uh, Around the fringe, though, you can see that red fringe, and that's the hydrogen. And in fact, uh, if we were to do a very long exposure, say a couple of hours, and process it just right, you would see that that red part of the cloud extends much farther out than what you see. 
Uh, in fact, it would literally fill the entire frame of this image. Uh, and that's just the ionized hydrogen uh, that was expelled by the star. Perfect. You just answered one of the questions that yeah. was uh, out there. I always think it's funny how we call this a dying star in the middle of uh, these uh, planetary nebula, yet they're going to remain glowing for billions of years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, not, not, not really dying, but definitely in a transition state. Well, yeah, but they're no longer doing fusion reactions. So right. That's why that's I consider true. them dead. Yeah. Well, yeah. When I die, it's going to take billions of years to for me to lose all my heat. So, <laughs> yeah. so are you going to be, are you going to be degenerate matter, Cheryl? Yeah. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> degenerate, already degenerate <laughs> matter. Yeah. So we call it a planetary nebula because a long time ago, when astronomers first started seeing these, they actually thought that it was a gas cloud that was condensing to form new planets. So they called them planetary nebula. The word nebula means cloud. Um, and eventually they realized they're not planets forming, they're, they're stars dying, but the term planetary nebula stuck. So there are quite a few of these out there. There are a lot of stars that are reaching the end of their lives. And most stars, when they reach the end of their lives, they form these planetary nebulas and go through this very long process of dying as opposed to a few stars that die in a supernova explosion. But it, although we hear a lot about it, supernova explosions, it's actually rare. Uh, fewer than 10% of all stars will die as a, in a supernova explosion. The vast majority die in this slow planetary nebula process. All right. Yeah. Maybe we should move on to Andromeda. I am right. noticing we are getting some high clouds and it's actually affected the uh, the exposure. So let's move more to a likely, better part of the sky. Yeah, more likely it's smoke from that uh, new fire down by Fresno. Yeah, it could uh, be, but it looks like yeah. clouds. It looks like high okay. clouds. All right. All right. Well, what I want to do, uh, I want to share my screen again if I can. Oh, yeah, and, please. And so I'm going to go over here. So the, the object we're gonna look at is, there we go, Andromeda. Uh, I'm gonna shrink this down here so you don't see that. Um, this is the Andromeda galaxy. This is a very nice photograph, uh, typical amateur astronomer uh, photograph where somebody has put a lot of work into getting a good image. Um, and when you see photos of the Andromeda galaxy in, uh, you know, books and magazines and on the internet, this is typical of what you see, this bright thing. Uh, you can see the dark dust lanes around it. It's a typical spiral galaxy. Uh, the Andromeda is a sister galaxy to the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's actually bigger than the Milky Way, but uh, it's part of a cluster. You see another uh, galaxy down there below. Uh, these are all part of what we call the local group uh, of galaxies. Um, so this is what you see. This galaxy is actually relatively close to the Milky Way galaxy. It's only two and a half million light years away. Um, and it is bright enough that you can see it with your naked eye. So if you find a really dark location, uh, you can uh, look, if you know where to look, uh, you can see the Andromeda galaxy. It looks like a little oval. But before we actually take a picture of it with our telescope, I wanna warn you about something. You're gonna be disappointed because the image you're gonna see does not look anything like what you see in this image. And the reason for that is that on the sky, on what we call the plane of the sky, the Andromeda galaxy is actually quite large. So just for comparison, most of you probably recognize this object. That's the moon. If you look at the moon in the sky with your naked eye, its size on the sky is about a half a degree wide. If we look at the Andromeda galaxy, if we could somehow turn up the brightness so we could easily see it with our naked eye and see the full extent of it, here's what we would discover. Its size is four times 
the diameter of the full moon. It and, is and, what's, and what's the distance to the Andromeda two, galaxy? Two, two, and and million, million. Million two and a half million light million. years. Two and a half million light years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's actually huge. And because of that, we can't get the whole thing in our field of view of the telescope. In fact, our telescope's field of view is smaller than one lunar diameter. So here's an example of what the field of view of the telescope is going to be. So we're going to point the telescope at the central <laughs> core, and all you're going to see is this bright, fuzzy blob. But it'll be the Andromeda galaxy. All right? So with that... I'm going to give it back to you, Richard, and I'm going to slew on over to Andromeda. All right. Uh, I have to take a couple of steps here. So I'll head over yeah. to Alpha Rats first. Alpha Rats is one of the corners of the great square of Pegasus. Yeah. In case anybody's interested. Technically speaking, it's not part of Pegasus, but it's always drawn that way. There it is. Yeah, there it is, way, way off to the side. Now, this is not the Andromeda galaxy. We're not yeah, there yet. No. We're just <laughs> this is the star. Zeroing in on the star. A nice bright star, easy to find. Okay. Joan wants to know if uh, the Andromeda galaxy would be better seen in Leia. No, not not much better because it's still going to be magnified yeah. so much. It's a long focal, a focal length. Focal yeah. Length. It's best it's best in a shorter focal length telescope. So our, our historical instruments and our research instruments are all long focal length. Yeah, some of the best images are not taken with a telescope. They're taken with a camera, camera with a telephoto yeah. lens on it. Yep. All right, so here we go. Now, if you want to see the globular clusters in Andromeda, then all of our <laughs> telescopes are well suited for that. Yeah, yeah. With a long enough exposure, yeah. With, with yeah, well, no, you can see the naked. You can see the naked eye. I mean, on a good night, but uh, well, it has to be dark. Okay, so you probably want to do at least a thirty-second exposure. Yeah, let me get over there. And hopefully, I've lowered everybody's expectations. Yeah, you did a good job on, on lowering <laughs> see, all of our like expectations. The Ring Nebula. What do, what do we have there? Yeah. <laughs> So an interesting article that came out this week about the Andromeda galaxy is that uh, gas cloud from Andromeda is already reaching the Milky Way yeah. because we are, oh, yeah. uh, we are effectively colliding with the Andromeda galaxy already. Yep. It has we, started. We, we will okay, merge. we're off a little bit. You see, it's oh, on the yeah. top. Yep, yep, yep. So... I can see a glow up there. It looks like you're close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So try it again. Yeah, uh, it's I, on I, a loop. So uh, okay. So we're going to be smeared on this one. That's okay. So if we do long enough exposure at the right ASA, there setting, we go. We're getting okay. there. Uh, go down a little bit more. So the bright spot you see surrounded by that glow, that is the central core of Andromeda. Okay, so the next one will look right. Everything is yeah, doubled yeah, up here. Yeah, that's because I was moving it while I was exposing. It's our stereo image. <laughs> And then I'll change the, I'll play with the exposure. So, so just to pick up on what Richard was talking about, uh, Andromeda and Milky Way are moving toward each other and we expect them to merge somewhere around three to 4 billion years from now. 
Okay, so you can see a little bit of the dark lanes uh, to below and to the right of the central core. It's pretty faint, but it's in there. Uh, yeah, right, right in that right area. Right in there. there. And yeah, some maybe, over here, too. Maybe a little bit longer exposure. You might be able to. Yeah, get let's try it. Uh, I'll have to abort this one. And uh... so we're doing 20 at 8. Uh, let me go to 30. See what that looks like. All right. Give it a few seconds here. I see. I think you've got a couple extra hot pixels tonight. <laughs> oh way. yeah, they're they're popping up. Yeah, they're breeding. They're breeding like rabbits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't you, you just need to stick a piece of dry ice on the back side of the camera, and everything will there be fine. There we go. That's nice. Brian yeah. says, um, "How do we know that Andromeda is similar to the Milky Way?" It's a good question. Well, by very carefully mapping the stars in the Milky Way uh, with different techniques for doing that and measuring their distances, we can actually figure out the distribution of the stars in the Milky Way. And we realize the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy like uh, Andromeda, although uh, it's uh, what we call a bent spiral. So uh, if we were outside of it, rather than looking like a nice flat disc it looks like a disc with uh the edges bent down one edge bent down the other edge bent up a little bit um, but other than that it's pretty similar uh it's a spiral galaxy the, the thing we do know though is that andromeda is bigger than the milky way it's about i'd say 10 15 percent larger in size uh, spiral. What they, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Spire is, go, go ahead, Richard. Oh, yeah. What I was going to say is uh, when, when galaxies collide, it's not like a hard collision. It's not like, you know, air, you know two cars on the freeway colliding. So stars are still going to be very far apart during the collision. You're, you know, it's like having two quarters on a football field when, you know, uh, uh, 70 yards apart. And uh, the likelihood of stars actually colliding with one another are very, very low. But what happens is all of that gravitational effect the collective gravity of the uh, individual galaxies uh, put stresses on the geometrical structure of the neighboring galaxy. And so our nice spiral shape that we have in the Milky Way may be disrupted and probably will be disrupted by the collision with Andromeda and vice right. versa. And we'll have like trails of stars bridging the two galaxies. And uh, maybe later in the year, we'll be able to show some examples of that through the telescope. Yeah, and actually quite a few of the stars will be literally ejected from Right. Yeah, if you search for it, there's some good simulations of what it will look like over billions of years. Yeah. Uh, it does kind of yeah. distorts both galaxies and kind of swirls around each other. It's a very interesting effect. We, we have a demonstration that we do in our planetarium. Unfortunately, our, we can't operate the planetarium right now because of the pandemic, but uh, uh, we, we have a, a nice demo video. Uh, it's a full, full dome video that, that shows the effect of two galaxies colliding. That's pretty dramatic. So what, what, what's the relative speed of uh, the approach between the Milky it's, Way it's, and, it's and a Canada? It's a little over 100 kilometers per second. Okay. So that's but it's got a pretty fast. Go. Yeah. yeah, but it's yeah. fast. And it will speed up as they get closer. So I don't know if you want to go with a higher ISO or go with a longer Want exposure. And let me let me try a higher ISO and see what happens. <clears throat> what at eight hundred? I'm at eight hundred now. I can oh go yeah, 16. go to sixteen hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll see a little more.
we're not talking. People are thinking, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> oh, no, we're, we're watching we're, the we're, counter. We're, we're mesmerized we're, by the, uh, we're, by we're the we're counter. Just, just trying to eke out a little more detail from the images here. Yeah, not much. Not more. much more detail. Uh, you got yeah. more noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, sure well, you, the... you can see, if you look real close to the central core, you can see a little bit of dark banding right there. there. It's kind of right, right there. There you there, go. Yeah. There you go. So, so you're getting the idea. But again, because of the very small field of view of our uh, setup here, we can't even begin to see the full disk of the Andromeda galaxy. So this is the best we can do. Um, and, and, you know, some of those really great images that you see of Andromeda w weren't even taken with the telescope. They were taken with a camera, uh, uh, with a telephoto lens uh, on a mount that will track so that they can do long exposures and keep the object uh, centered in the field of view. And that's, that's really the way you get a good image of the Andromeda galaxy. It's one of the hardest things to photograph, in, I think, to photograph well. Yeah. Bill, Bill Drilling, one of He has uh, a good one. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a really great one. Yeah. And Bill Drilling is one of the members of the East Bay Astronomical Society. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, this is obviously a disappointing galaxy, but maybe we can go to another one that's not quite so big on the sky and yeah, we'll see if it's bright enough. Yeah. See if there's real galaxy out there all right alan roach says uh do the folks living in andromeda mind if we're taking their picture i guess we won't know that for about a two and a half million years two and a half million we years from them. yeah we'll get the cease and, des uh, cease cease and, desist, and desist order, desist order. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay so shall we go see the deer lit group yeah let's give it a shot all right uh, i've just been I'm gonna trying go to try this I'm going to go to a star first to make sure we're synchronized. Yeah, you want to go to uh, 7331 specifically. Right. Though, yeah. Because the others are really very dim. Okay, live view. All right, hold on. There we are, down here. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Then we'll sync it. And here we go. It's not there yet. All right. Yeah, I know. All right, we there? Yeah, yeah. we should be All there. Right. All right, let's give it a shot. I think the first time I ever saw this galaxy was through this telescope. I think Conrad showed it to me. Let's see if we see it. Yeah, there we go. That's not bad at all. Oh, there you go. Okay, so this is this doesn't have a name um uh beyond its ngc number which is ngc 7331 but it is part of a group of galaxies called the deer lick group and the i always imagine like a salt lick surrounded by deer <laughs> when they talk about the deer lick group but it's really the lick observatory and deer is uh, one of the astronomers involved and uh it's but that's what they named it and i'm sure they got a kick out of calling yeah. it that. 
So and, you, uh, so, can, so the, 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 the contrast with Andromeda here, well, first of all, you see that it's got a bright central core, just like Andromeda did. But this galaxy is 40 million light years away. It's 20 times the distance of Andromeda. So that's why we're able to see the entire thing. I reposition the telescope here. That's fine. I thought, yeah, there we go. Yeah, you did. It's yeah, there, there, there you go. Great. So Let's you see if gonna... I can denoise this a little bit by lowering the uh, black point. There we go. So you're probably wondering, you know, well, gee, you know, I've seen pictures of spiral galaxies and pictures and they look a lot better than this and you'd be right uh, but those pictures are usually done uh, with very long exposures like yeah. hour, hour yeah. long exposures uh, we're trying to do this in 30 seconds so yeah i usually when i photographed uh, this galaxy i think i did six hours of exposure yeah time. yeah in different and, filters right in different filters and all that yeah, yeah. so so we're trying to just do the quick the quick fix here 30 second exposures and see what we got so this is an, another spiral galaxy uh spirals are by far the most common type of galaxy that we see out there uh and there's literally billions of them out there that we can see um uh, and this is just one of the cool ones. Well, what's nice is it's you know bright enough to really tell what it is. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you look at spiral galaxies through a telescope uh, or you know home telescope, uh, and it's like you you make out of this little smudge. You can barely tell it's even there. Yeah. This one actually yeah. looks like a galaxy. Now there's a. Another one, uh, a cluster of galaxies close by. Yeah, it's called uh, Stefan's Quintet. Right, right. And it's a uh, it's a uh, classified as a Hickson group as well. So, but those those are quite far away. And and fainter. <laughs> yeah, and what's interesting about those is uh, it, it's it's five galaxies in a cluster, uh, hence the quintet in the uh, Stefan's Quintet. Uh, and four of them are moving away. They're red shifted, but one of them is blue shifted. Blue shifted means it's moving toward us. Toward us, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to announce that the temperature here is finally below 90 degrees. Oh man, <laughs> it's, what a relief. It's 89, 89.7 <laughs> degrees. Feels so much cooler now. Yeah, I know. Oh God. I may have to get my jacket out. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. This came, you know, uh, this this view came out better than I thought it was going to. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm quite pleased that we were able to show people this. Well, uh, why don't we make this our last objects and let's just take questions for a little while. And okay, sounds good. See if we can uh, teach some astronomy. Somebody wants to know. Uh, said that the moon is just rising. Uh, are we going to look at it? No, unfortunately, we don't have a good view to the east from here. The moon is just barely above the horizon right now, and it has to get up above the, the building that we have um, right to the east of where we are. So, no, we can't look at the moon tonight. Yeah. Somebody asked, uh, are these uh, sessions available after the fact as recordings? And the answer is yes. All you have to do is go to the uh, uh, Chabot Facebook uh, group or Facebook page and go into the video archive and you'll find all of Chabot's live events listed. You can watch hours and hours of Richard, yeah. Gerald, and John. Yeah. <laughs> our, our snarky remarks never get old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just remember everything I know I learned from Star Trek. <laughs> um, Sean asked, uh, there are some red and green spots. Uh, yes, that's all noise, um, especially with the temperature 
uh, at 90 degrees and no cooling on the camera. What happens is that a CMOS sensor of this type that's in a Canon DSLR, so also same type of sensor that's in your cell phone, um, generates a great deal of noise. And uh, you know, pixels are firing off all the time just from the heat, uh, not necessarily from what you're photographing. So that's what you're saying. And what you may not realize is uh, the chip in your camera is overlaid with a grid of different colored um, lenses, if you will. Um, and what color you see depends on what combination of red, green, or blue uh, pixels are firing off. So if you just see red, that means that just the red pixels are firing off. If you just see green, that means just the green ones are firing off. And I believe there's actually more green ones than there are blue and red. I forget how that works. Sasha asks a really great question. I have no idea what the answer is. And to, we were talking a bit earlier about Stefan's quintet, and um, uh, maybe maybe she's seen a photograph of that. Um, if you've never seen a photograph of Stefan's quintet, you could look it up on Google. Uh, but how big are those galaxies compared to the Milky Way? I really have no no way to answer that. Um, I suspect they're smaller galaxies yeah. than the Milky Way. Um, I, but, I, I don't know off the top of my yeah, head. I don't know. Don't know enough about that. Yeah, the Milky Way is actually a bit on the large size. Uh, yeah. Uh, Angela, uh, yes, before COVID, uh, all of our uh, telescopes here at Chabot were open to the public every fr Friday and Saturday night for uh, free viewing. And uh, hopefully next year we'll be back in the swing of things and doing that again for you. So. Stay with us. Wash your hands, wear your mask. All right. And we'll get rid of it. Yep. At least for a while, it'll be different. But yeah. We'll, we'll we're going to we're gonna have to ease back into normality, but we, we hope for the best here. But, but until then, we're going to be doing this every Saturday night. Uh, so feel free to join us anytime. Um, We'll do it starting at nine o'clock every Saturday night uh, from now until we can reopen the telescopes again. Got any other questions coming up? Yeah, I think that's about it. Getting thank yous. Ryan really wants to see uh, Neptune and Uranus. And unfortunately, that's for a little bit later in the year. Yep, you'll see that in the fall. We'll, we'll be sure to do that. Yeah, I think actually Neptune is probably up right now, but I'm not sure. Actually, can't find it. Where is it? Neptune right now? Um, during the, our viewing sessions, Daniel, uh, when the when we were open to the public, uh, yeah, there was an there's eyepieces on the telescope, and people would just be able to look through naked eye and whatever we were pointed at. And we have three telescopes, so all three of them would be open. Um, uh, another galaxy question, the bright light in the middle is the core of the galaxy. And the reason it's a bright area is because that's the highest density of stars in the spiral galaxies in the core. But uh, you're right, there is most likely a black hole in the middle of all that. Uh, most spiral galaxies or bar, what are called barred spiral galaxies have uh, uh, or are believed to have a black hole in the center, possibly two in some cases. Yeah, in fact, the structure of the uh, galaxy is actually an indication of the mass of the, the black hole. Mm -hmm. So elliptical galaxies tend to have more massive black holes. And Yeah, that's a, that was a good question. Is there some way to make the counter a bit smaller? No, <laughs> unfortunately not. I wish there was. Um, it's an annoyance. 
But I'll tell you, when you're actually doing astrophotography, you know, quietly by yourself, and you're trying to get hours of data, uh, being able to look at a big counter is really helpful. Uh, it's not so great for what we're doing right now. I'll probably hide the counter entirely. Is this the? No, <laughs> that's a big grid. All right. Any other questions? Do the galaxy positions change depending on which part of the Earth we look from? No, not really. Yeah, the uh, galaxies are so far away that uh, any place on Earth, as long as it's facing in the nighttime direction, we'll see basically the same thing. All right. All right. I think that's about it then. All right. All right. Well, well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It was fun yeah. tonight and uh, we'll see you next week. I hope. Yep. All right. And uh, thank you all for your donations as well. And, everybody. Uh, enjoy Thanks, your everybody. Week. Everybody take it easy. All right. Take care.